in your windowsill with Brooklyn Botanic Garden and New York City Parks Green Thumb, you're in the right place. Um, so we're really lucky to have so many of us joining and tuning in virtually today. Um, so for, again, for folks who are just tuning in, please go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat box. You can share your name, um, your pronouns, if you're part of a community garden and where you're calling from. Um, so this is part of a day long series of virtual events celebrating the 50th anniversary of, of Earth Day um, with Green Thumb, with New York City Parks Community Gardening Program. And we're really excited for all of the events today and really grateful that you're able to join us. Um, and we're really thankful also to Maureen O'Brien from the Brooklyn Botanic Garden who will be leading this workshop today. Um, and if you need to see the full calendar of events um, that's happening today, I'll put that in the chat box. Um, but we'll be having workshops today from uh, till 7 p.m. Eastern um, Standard Time. So um, I just also wanted to remind folks to please stay um, muted throughout the um, workshop. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat box and we'll be monitoring that and help with the Q&A session um, to answer your questions. You. Um, and yeah, also uh, we will be recording this webinar. Um, so if you want to share this recording with members of your community garden after the fact, um, you can do that as well. Um, and yeah, again, just wanted to thank everyone who's tuning in today and taking the time to learn more about growing food and sustainability today. As we all know, it's more important than ever. Um, and community gardens are such a source of hope and um, community resiliency, particularly in these really challenging times. So we thank you all for your efforts and everything that you all are doing to stay safe and protect each other right now. So um, with that, I want to turn it over to Maureen O'Brien, who is leading our workshop on growing greens in your windowsill with um, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. So thank you so much. Um, and again, for anyone who's just tuning in, please um, introduce yourself in the chat box. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, for the introductions. And um, thank you very much to uh, Mara uh, for inviting me to um, share some information today. And also to Bill Losasso uh, for making these uh, occasions possible. Um, so my name is Maureen O'Brien. I'm the community field manager at Brooklyn Botanic Garden. I'm also a community gardener and have been for the last uh, 25 years at 615 C Community Garden in South Park Slope. So uh, welcome everybody. I'm so really thrilled uh, to see some new faces, to see new faces and to feel connected with uh, other people. So, um, uh, Let's see. Um, and happy Earth Day. Uh, one thing that's a little bit different, uh, I'll say for me and maybe for you about this workshop, is that the format is going to be a little different. Instead of having it be kind of a dialogue through the whole thing, it's going to be more like a lecture and demo. And then we're going to have plenty of time for questions at the end. So please do put questions in the uh, chat area. So we can get to those. And then also, I know that some people are joining this workshop by phone, so there won't be a visual. And so um, I want to be reminded if I need to talk, to explain what I'm holding sometimes, because I've rehearsed a couple times and I keep forgetting that. So uh, please feel free to remind me. How's that sound? Good. Okay. So, to get started, I thought, what if we do a little grounding exercise to kind of get connected to ourselves and connected to each other? So, I wanted to uh, just take a minute for everybody to just let's share a nice big communal inhale. So, big, big inhale, fill up those lungs, and then exhale. Nice, easy exhale. Okay, so close your eyes. Take another big, deep, long inhale. Gently breathe out. Keep your eyes closed for a couple minutes. So just in your mind, think 
think about the windows in your life. Do they get sunlight? Is there room for a small little window box, like four by eight inches on any of the windows in your imagination? Take another big inhale, exhale, and then open your eyes. Okay, here we are. We're back at the workshop. Um, so I hope you have in your mind um, a windowsill that might be in your life and wondering if it might be something that could fit this four by eight inch container. Um, so today we're going to make a container um, from a half gallon juice or milk container. So, first of all, what type of plants might grow successfully on a windowsill? So, I would like to recommend plants that basically you harvest the leaves because, um, you know, the way that plants grow, they usually start from seeds or maybe a cutting, then they grow a little bit of stem, then they grow some leaves, then they grow some more stem, and then they got the flower, and then they have the fruit. So something like a tomato needs to go through all of those things to get to a fruit, and that takes a lot of energy. And since most windowsills are low light situations and the box is really small, being able to harvest things where the plant only has to spend the energy to make leaves is a way to kind of match the conditions with a successful outcome for the plants. So for, um, for vegetable plants, lettuces, uh, especially like mini lettuces, baby kale, tatsoi, arugula, mixed greens, mini chard, baby mustard, pak choy, or mosh. Those could be good um, choices. And I have some uh, seed packets here that, you know, have some words like little Caesar, uh, baby romaine, Jade gem, these are all kind of small variety seeds. Or they, they mature quickly, so the, the mature size is kind of small. So I wanted to show you, this is a box of some baby greens. Let's see if we can see this. Okay, so I'm holding up a milk container that has in it uh, three types of lettuce. This one is that little baby romaine. This is a chartreuse uh, leaf lettuce. And this is something called Amish freckles. So there's just three plants because this is kind of a small container. And, um, you know, these have been growing pretty successfully. Normally I would say, what are your questions about that? But we'll ask that later on. Um, the next uh, type of uh, plants that I would recommend for a windowsill greens garden would be herbs. So herbs that can take some low light herbs that, uh, trying to think, don't have uh, fruiting things or flowering. Like for example, chamomile, you use the flowers, but other herbs like parsley, cilantro, chives, mint, lemon balm, borage, shiso, plus other herbs too, are things that can um, take some low light conditions. So I have another box. <laughs> Another windowsill garden. I'm holding up a container now that has, this is cilantro, Italian parsley, and curly parsley. So these are things that can be grown successfully. So what if the window that you imagined is on an air shaft and actually there's no light? Or what if there isn't a window? Can you still grow something on a windowsill or a little table? Well, Mara Gittleman, um, I think, presented a workshop or is working on a workshop on microgreens. Did that happen already? Okay, so that happened already. So for those of you who, who already went, uh, went to that workshop, it is possible to grow um, some greens without any light, but it's better to have some light. So right here, this is just a little version that has baby kale in it. So it takes a lot more seeds, but don't despair if you don't have light, you can still grow something. 
Okay. Those are the sprouts. They can work in the dark. So what do seeds need to thrive? Kind of like us, they need sunlight, water, shelter, food, love, and attention. Uh, so low light, even on a sunny windowsill because of the panes of glass, it's very important to kind of match the type of plant with the conditions. So if you're on the very top of a building and have super sunny or a roof, maybe uh, plants that can use a little bit more light would be fine, but um, we're gonna stick with low light things. Um, next, shelter. So plants need a container and soil. I'm gonna call that the, the shelter part of this. Um, I also wanna thank um, Sarah Edstein and Joanne Doria and Barbara Kerr Kerr Kerlin uh, at Brooklyn Botanic Garden because they gave us the ideas for this um, uh, half gallon jug. Okay, soil. So use a soilless medium like potting soil. Um, this one has little uh, perlite in it. It's like perlite and compost. This one is some cocoa coir, which is from the um, coconut industry. It's like shredded up husks. You want to use a soilless medium rather than garden soil because garden soil has, uh, especially in indoors, because garden soil has bacteria in it, which is not necessarily bad, but because there isn't good air circulation, if you've ever had the experience where you have seedlings, they're starting inside, they're going really good, and then you come out one day and like they're all slumped over like this. That's called damping off, and that happens because of the bacteria in the soil, they start eating away at the part where the soil meets the plant. Um, so use uh, a soilless medium. Uh, Hoyer is good. Regular soil mixes, especially organic, are good. Um, you can make your own by sifted compost uh, with one third sifted compost, one third sand, and one third hoyer or perlite, which is like expanded uh, sand, I think. Um, okay. Uh, now, one thing which I'm going to talk about a little bit later is that what if you don't have potting soil? So, um, I've been doing a little bit of experimenting with using used tea leaves. So I'll just show one of these quick. But this is some cabbage, some baby cabbage that is sprouting in used tea leaves. We drink a lot of tea here, and um, but I'm not gonna recommend it yet because I still need to test it a little bit more. Um, okay, so next we have the container. So um, this is a half gallon milk container. Um, so clean the, clean the uh, container really well with hot soapy water, squish it around really good. Um, you can also use a container like this, which is a broth box. You could use a plastic container. Uh, this is like a berry box I'm showing with a little under tray, you know, upcycle things, clean them really good. Sometimes it's recommended to use a vinegar water solution to kind of sterilize it a little bit more or a bleach water solution to sterilize things. But actually, I'm saving my bleach. I'm not using it for any containers. So hot soapy water should be just fine. Okay, so for this, make sure that the, the top hole is facing up. Uh, I'm going to turn it up. Well, I'm going to turn it upside down first. And I have a just a regular kitchen knife. I'm going to stab a couple holes in it and twist it to make some drainage holes. So I'm just uh, cutting some spaces in the bottom. And then I'm going to puncture the top of it just to get it started. So I'm going to cut the top off so that we have a place to put the soil and the plants. top and then here's our little container ready to plant. So I'm not going to throw away this top part because this actually makes great labels for plants. So you can 
just use a scissor to cut out shapes like this. So it's a little long triangular shape, and then you could write the kind of plant on, on that. Um, okay. Where are we now? Um, so for this, let's plant three uh, herbs that have similar uh, light and water requirements. So today I thought we would plant um, chives, cilantro, and mint. So we're gonna use seeds for the uh, chives and cilantro and a little transplant for the mint. Okay, so we talked about the soilless medium. And right here, I have a little bit of potting soil in this bowl. I have a little bit more potting soil here. You see, I'm using these little containers for basically everything these days. Uh, pouring some soil in this container. And actually, instead of using this big shovel, which seems a little bit ridiculous for this scale, I'm going to just switch. So I'm just going to use a big kitchen spoon, mix this up a little bit and then add water a little bit at a time because you don't want it to be too wet. So it should feel kind of like a wrung out sponge. And thank you, Lillian Reyes, for your workshop yesterday. Thank you for this little uh, bottle idea. I'm, I'm uh, using a container that has holes in the top to moisten this soil. So the idea is it should feel like a wrung out sponge I'm going to put my glove on it to squeeze it. So yeah, it should feel good. There shouldn't be any, there shouldn't be any liquid coming through the, these spaces. So we just say like no more, no tears. If you have tears, it means it's too wet and you don't want to drown the plants. Okay, so next, we get a, gonna get a little under tray so that we can start filling the soil up here. So fill it up you know, within a couple of inches of the top, not to the tippity top, and then firm it down so that it's not super packed tight, just, just firm, but you don't wanna squish it down to be too compressed. So just put it in lightly and keep tapping it down. <clears throat> So I have one, I'm holding up one that I pre-filled before this workshop because I'm really messy and I thought that might be a messy part and I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for questions. So here we are, we have this. I have uh, cilantro seeds, actually bunching onion seeds because I couldn't find my chive seeds. I don't know what to tell you about that. I haven't even used this. And some mint. Uh, also, uh, Lillian, thank you for recommending uh, trying out herbs. So these are also cilantro seeds from the store, but they're a little bit old, so we'll use some fresh seeds. So um, at BBG, we have a kind of design thing that we like to talk about, which I'd like to do with this container. So the chives are kind of gonna be tall, or the onions will be tall. The cilantro will be kind of like a medium size, and then the mint, will kind of cascade over the edge. So we like to call those, the tall thing is the thriller, the medium size is the filler, and then the cascading thing is the spiller. So we'll have the thriller, the filler, and the spiller, and that's because we're from Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Um, all right, so I'm gonna take a couple seeds, like two or three seeds of the cilantro, plant them in one corner. Uh, I'm taking a few of the bunching onion and I'm gonna plant that in the center. Right, that's too many seeds. And then for the, for the mint, which these are little seedlings from a pot of mint that I have, I'm going to just take a, a regular uh, kitchen knife, butter knife, and put those, kind of dig those into the side. So having three plants like this, there should be, you know, that's that's enough. We don't want to crowd it too much. 
Uh, then I'm going to put a little bit of dry soil on the top, just a little bit. It'll say on the package how deep to plant them. And I think these are probably like a quarter inch deep or eighth of an inch deep. Um, so now they're planted. Just going to firm it just a little bit, just tapping it down so that they're in good contact with the soil. So the next thing is you need to water it. So watering should be with a light spray, not like a big pour of water, otherwise the seeds could get dislodged. So this kind of sprinkling is okay. Another thing that I like to do is to fill up a container with water. So I have like kind of an under container here that's a little plastic, um, uh, container a little bit big for a windowsill but when i water this i'll probably just fill this up with water and then dunk it in there for a couple of minutes and then let it drain off uh let's see oh okay something i forgot to say so one of the reasons uh that i picked the chives cilantro and mint is because uh I, we're my family were eating and cooking a lot of kind of pantry staple things so we're eating a lot of potatoes and pasta and rice and beans. And these flavors are pretty strong. And actually mint is really good with uh, potatoes. I don't like love mint, but I've been trying uh, things that I don't usually use. And it just kind of adds some nice zing to uh, foods that are a little bit bland. Um, okay, let's see. What else? Oh, also, Important not to crowd. If you have a whole bunch of seeds that come up, like I did put like maybe four cilantro seeds there. So when the four plants come up, you'll need to thin it back. So just cut them back and eat them or use them in a dish or just sacrifice them and cut them. Um, what else? Oh, yes, water. So uh, keep things moist uh, until they germinate. So once you start seeing little plants, it's okay to let it dry out a little bit, but the soil should feel kind of cool to the touch. It shouldn't feel sopping wet because the seeds could rot, um, but it shouldn't feel hot or dry when you touch it. Does that make sense? Um, what else? Um, Maureen, we just had one related question about yes. that. Um, someone asked if they should soak the seeds before planting. That is a fantastic question. I'm going to do a little time check for me here. Um, bigger seeds like the cilantro seeds, I would say you could soak those uh, overnight uh, or for a couple of hours. So bigger seeds usually can take some soaking. Small seeds like the, and actually uh, things in the allium family like onions and scallions and chives, they could be soaked as well. But like I wouldn't soak lettuce seeds because they're so light. You could actually put them in some water to see if they, uh, uh, if they're floating, like after a couple of hours, they should sink to the bottom. That means they have an embryo inside of those because they're heavier. If they're just laying on the top, it means that they're probably no good anymore. So um, if you have big seeds, it will help them germinate faster. And, you know, depending on the time of year, some things, you know, they, they sprout anywhere between three days and three weeks, depending on the, the conditions. Like parsley takes a long time to um, germinate. So it's a good idea to soak those seeds. Thank you for your question. Uh, are there related questions at the moment? Um, we have other a couple other questions. Someone asked about um, the light available from her windowsill. Um, if she plants cilantro and parsley, uh, would that work or does it need more direct light? Yeah, actually, cilantro and parsley and um, uh, other other plants like that, they can take a little bit of shade, so um, they can grow in low light. Things like, you know, basil needs more light. Um, a big head of lettuce certainly would need more light. Um, so these are things with more modest light requirements. Um, and then if it's, if you do try something and it kind of doesn't work, then I would say, doing the microgreens would be the way to go. Okay, so we have, so far we have um, the soil, the container, the seeds, the water, 
Um, I think the next things would be some more food um, and then the a tender loving care, of course. So um, for it's a good idea, especially when starting seeds, to feed things uh, once every two weeks with a diluted fish emulsion, um, which I have here somewhere. So fish emulsion uh, or compost tea. So um, especially if you make your own compost, those things are good. Uh, these days, you know, we want to stay at home. And so I am doing a little experimenting with um, other things that could work as fertilizers. So again, I'm still experimenting. I don't have something exactly to recommend, but I've read recipes for um, a comfrey tea. So I'm gonna use some comfrey teas and blend that kind of like you would do a compost tea. And then I'm also using um, or experimenting with uh, something that I call pot liquor. So that's when you steam vegetables and there's water left over in the pan and that has like vitamins and nutrients from the vegetables in it. So using that or potato water, watering those down and I'm testing them to see if they make any difference. Um, but since these uh, potting mixes are kind of sterile, some have a little fertilizer in them, but most of them don't. So after the plants get to a certain size, like in those boxes we saw in the beginning, they'll need, they'll need some food. Um, let's see, then the, then the love part, let's see. Oh, oh, another thing. So we just planted uh, cilantro, chives, and mint. Uh, but, you know, in a couple hours, I'll be like, what did I plant in their box? So use those little plant tags that we made from the top to label your plants. So I put the cilantro here, the mint here, and the chives here. And I'm just showing those tags in this little box. Um, the next thing is, is that when your plants start emerging, so the care is gonna be, you know, you're making sure they get light and water, and then it's a good idea to just kind of stroke them a little bit every day. Just pet them, tell them how much you love them, what recipe you're gonna use them in, and that makes them have a little bit of a stronger stem and even though, you know, they're not outside, but it's a little bit like getting tossed back and forth in the wind. Um, uh, another thing, I'm checking my notes here, hot liquor herb box, um, is to kind of extend the harvest once you do have these growing. So for example, you could cut the whole lettuce down to the stub and then it could sprout a few more leaves, but you could also just start taking the leaves off little by little. And um, I'm kind of getting a little bit more enamored of the herbs in a small space because you can just use a little bit whenever you eat. So make sure you plant things that you like to eat, unless you want to try something new. Like with the mint on potatoes, I would never do that in a million years if I had another option, but it's actually really good. Um, let's see, are there microgreens? So I guess we planted these and, oh, I know what I wanted to say. We planted these and they're going to end up looking a little bit like this. So this is one that I did before. This has actually garlic chives. So that's our nice tall thriller. Here is the fluffy cilantro, the, the filler. And then here's some mint, which is the spiller, which is even coming out of the side spout there. So that'll give you a little bit of an idea of what it could look like. And yeah, I think that's, I think I'm ready for some questions. Great, thank you so much, Maureen. Um, that's super helpful. Um, We've got a couple of questions from the chat box. Um, one person asked, are plastic milk containers okay? I know you mentioned using a couple of different um, plastic yeah. DIY options. A plastic options. milk container like this or bigger would be totally fine. Um, just wash it out really good. Uh, you know, a plastic pot would be fine. Um, even round pots would be fine if you have them. 
but especially now um, that we're sheltering in place, if you have, um, you know, juice or milk or something like that around, those are possible as well. Great, thank you. And could you just touch on a little bit more about the why you'd use potting soil in or instead of, instead of other types of soil? Yeah. So the the biggest reason for that would be because of the um, the damping off. Um, and the bacteria in soil. So again, the, bac the bacteria is not bad. It's just that the conditions are inside. And for starting from seed, it's definitely uh, recommended for success to use a sterilized potting soil, or a soilless medium, or the cocoa coir. And maybe next workshop I'll say, or some old tea, tea, tea leaves. I did start to in, um, these are, this is actually popcorn. So I'm showing tea bags. This was um, chamomile tea. Uh, and I slit them open and put little pieces of dried popcorn in them to experiment to see if they would sprout. So trying to stretch a little bit um, to use things that are just available at home. Absolutely. So plenty of ways to be creative with what's lying around. Yep. Um, and could you just speak a little bit more about uh, poking drainage holes and why that's important? Sure. So um, it's important that when you that the that the plants don't uh, drown. So it's important to have a place where the water can go. Um, and it's also good to have one of those um, uh, trays underneath, like this one. I have a tray underneath just to catch any drips. So you want to water your plant thoroughly, either by filling a container up with water and then dunk your uh, planted plants in there, let them have a nice good drink of that, and then take it out. If they're just sitting in water, basically the roots will rot or the seeds will rot. So they need just the right amount, not too much, not too little. If the soil is hot or dry to the touch, then you probably need some water. If it's cool um, or looks wet, looks glistening, then it's probably too wet. Great, thank that you. Helps. Yeah, totally. Um, someone also asked, how many seeds did you put in for the cilantro and onion? So for the onion, I put like uh, maybe like six to eight, imagining that they were chives and chives kind of sprout multiple things. Uh, for the cilantro, I put three or four, thinking that I would just cut them back um, to one plant. So you just have three plants in there so that they'll all survive. It, it is my tendency to try to squeeze too many plants in a small space. And then what happens is that none of them do that good. So I think three is a good number because this is really a small container. It's only four inches this way and eight inches this way. Um, yeah. Great. And this is good too because you can harvest all these side leaves and the plants will keep growing. That's great. Um, and someone also asked, can you wrap the plant, uh, or it might have been seed, uh, in plastic wrap to help it germinate? Um, so you could put plastic wrap over the top. For example, you because uh, like sometimes those the kits have like a little top or plastic wrap to help germination. So before the seeds emerge, it's important that the soil stays moist. So not dripping. So you could use plastic wrap, but most seeds uh, will germinate in darkness. There are some seeds, if it says on the, the package needs light to germinate, then definitely you don't wanna cover them up with, you, you, you know, having a plastic wrap on top would be fine. Um, but a plastic, uh, like this is a plastic Q-tip box um, that just happens to fit a quart container. If you had another one, you could put that on the top to keep the moisture in. You also could use a plate or a pan on top of something because as long as it's dark, once, once they start emerging, it would be good to take that off, of course, so it gets the maximum amount of sunlight. Uh, and plastic wrap is fine too. Um, we also had a question, can you mix coffee grounds into the potting mix? Would that that was an excellent question. Um, I haven't tested that 
yet, but I know that coffee grounds in general, you can usually put right on your garden plants. The one thing I would be um, uh, concerned about, and I'm concerned with the tea leaves, is if they're too moist, they're kind of really dense in there, and that it could be uh, have mold starting to grow. I've seen that before with coffee uh, that I put just on my own community garden plot, like put a whole bunch of espresso packets down there, and then they get a little moldy on the on the edges. So I think if it's broken up and mixed in, it probably would be fine. You can experiment. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, and similarly, what about any kind of seaweed as fertilizer? Seaweed, seaweed fertilizers are great. Um, I've never made my own before. I imagine you might need to, uh, I don't know, if maybe if someone else knows, they can chime in. Sometimes I imagine they can have a lot of salt in them, so that may not be that good. They might need to be rinsed a little bit. But, you know, I know kelp is very nutritious and other seaweeds are. So seaweed fertilizer, I mean, the fish emulsion one, this again is a byproduct of the fishery industry. Um, I, in general, use compost tea. Um, but yeah, seaweed emulsion, any other kind of little fertilizers would be good. Uh, I'm gonna experiment a little bit with alfalfa. Um, so I'm gonna try to grow some alfalfa and then harvest that and like grind it up. Um, I've heard that you can soak grass clippings eggshells in water, but I just haven't done those things yet. So um, we'll see. If anyone else knows of a do-it-yourself, uh, you know, feeder for seedlings, love to hear about that so we can share with everybody else. Great. Um, we also had a question on airflow. Um, can you, would you recommend opening a window and could someone start it in a window box outside? Is there anything we people should be aware of in terms of protecting um, the little seedlings from wind and rain. Right. So uh, wind would be totally fine. It mostly just depends on the temperature. And, um, you know, for air circulation, uh, you know, as long as it's not that crowded, I think, you know, things should be fine. You can certainly like stroke them every once in a while. Um, I think plants benefit from sunlight and, and air. So if there's the opportunity to crack a window, that would be fine, especially when the weather gets warmer. As, as if, you, if you start, like say for example, if you started these, um, especially these lettuces inside and then wanted to transplant them to a window box outside, I would say do it on a cloudy day or start to kind of acclimate them to the outside little by little, almost like tomato plants take them out for a couple of hours and you bring them in, you let them, so you don't want to put them out um, in the sun, full sun day. They'll, they'll actually get all white splotches on them because they'll get sunburn. Um, and the one thing about window boxes is that all of these things would be great for window boxes. It's very, 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 very important to have your window box secured. So, window box that's not secure and fall can kill someone and it can kill someone and they have. Um, so it's very important that they're correctly uh, secured. And you can write to me, M O'Brien at bbg.org, and I'd be happy to send you a tip sheet about how to secure your window box. Great, that's a really helpful recommendation. Um, so I just put Maureen's email in the chat box as well. Um, we also had a question on where can you get seeds right now? That's another fantastic question. And I meant to say that about the potting soil too. So um, seed sources. Um, so there are some, actually, I just found out uh, today that Natty Gardens in Crown Heights by the Brooklyn Botanic Garden is open um, and they sell seeds. So some uh, grocery stores sell seeds. Sometimes hardware stores, if they're considered essential, sometimes some that have had lumber are doing curbside, uh, might have seeds. Um, I think that online sources for seeds are possibilities now. The one thing is there is definitely a delay in filling orders because, because seed companies are uh, have the same precautions that we all are, are going through working remotely, uh, people out ill. So um, 
I think that that's, you know, seed, seed companies, uh, safely trading seeds and sharing seeds. Uh, with other gardeners, with the family members, with friends, um, using pantry staples like uh, coriander, fennel seeds, cumin seeds, um, beans, you know, beans, chickpeas, things like that. Actually, I have a whole lot of sprouted chickpeas. Um, and then yesterday, I was going to, you know, show them here. And yesterday, I ate one of them, and I was like, mm, not so good. So chickpea sprouts are not my favorite, um, but the plants look really pretty. Um, another source for seeds that I want to encourage community gardeners to think about right now is, and I, I think that there's, um, I think in the New York Times yesterday, there was a, there's like panic buying on seeds right now. So there actually are some companies like Johnny Seeds, High Mowing Seeds, they've actually stopped taking orders from home gardeners. They're only taking orders from their agricultural um, uh, partners at the moment. So this winter was really mild. And so if in the fall through the winter you had um, stuff in your garden like uh, collards, kale, carrots, celery, those plants are going to start sending up, if they haven't already, they're going to start sending up uh, flower shoots um you know buds and flowers and then they'll be making seeds so i really recommend uh saving some seeds from those plants this year um i think that and actually i just finished um a blog for bbg called um about germination tests so i think it's called germination tests are my old seeds still good um and it talks a little bit about how to test your seeds um, and there's a link to a seed savers exchange um, PDF that talks about the average life of seeds. And also, I believe that they have some resources for isolation distance because some things can cross over. Um, but like carrots, like carrots will be going to seed soon. And sometimes they can cross with Queen Anne's lace. And then if you use those seeds, they might not come out to be the same carrots. But if you don't have any Queen Anne's lace around, then you're probably fine with that. Great. I just added your blog post in the chat box so folks can check that out after. Um, we also had a question about using um, onion and garlic from the store to start. Yes. yes. So um, onion and garlic from the store, often you can use those. Um, sometimes I would say uh, trying, you know, it's a good idea to order from, you know, a seed company to make sure you have disease free uh, plants. That's not necessarily guaranteed with things from the store uh, that have been handled and shipped differently. But I have definitely used um, organic garden uh, organic garlic from the Prospect Park Food Co-op to, you know, grow out and then harvest uh, garlic. Um, so you could you could try that. Um, another thing that often works, but it takes longer. So I've been doing like, uh, you know, using garlic to cook with, and then some of the garlic that I saved last year, the very ends of it are starting to sprout. So I've just been cutting those ends off, letting them dry out for a day and then planting those. So those are gonna take two years to make a head of garlic, but the very end of onions and um, garlic that's the basal plate. And that's a thing that sometimes there's a propagation method for bulbs, which garlic and onions are bulbs called chipping, chipping where you slice things and then you make new plants from that. So it does take longer because first the little garlic cutting would have to like grow a clove of garlic and then before it grows the whole head. Did that answer the question or did I go a little bit yeah, too- no, that's maybe? super helpful. Um, we had two more questions. One is about using like clay pots as well as a question about making the holes in the um, milk bottle cap. Oh, okay. Um, so you definitely can use a clay pot. I mean, any kind of pot, really, any kind of garden pot would be fine. Just make sure there's a saucer underneath it so it doesn't um, uh, harm the paint or wood of your windowsill. Um, you know, these, the, the, the plastic container or the, the paper covered uh, container of this milk carton 
is just a kind of upcycling do it yourself thing uh, that you might have around the house, but you could have any kind of container. Um, actually, I had I had some things in this like little fancy container that I that I found uh, out on the street, you know, months ago. Um, but uh, you know, you can do that. But I thought I thought that was a little bit too Martha Stewarty, so I didn't. And then the um, the holes in the top of this. So um, I used a, a drill to drill the holes. I took the I took that. So I'm showing the top of a of a, a bottle cap from milk from a quart of milk. So this has five little holes in it. So I drilled. I put it on a piece of wood, then drilled uh, five little holes in it with like a one thirty second of an inch maybe drill thing. I think in Lillian Reyes's workshop the other day, she had something, did, did she say, um, I think she said she had a heated nail maybe, which you have to be very careful with, with you know, heat and plastic, you know, it kind of melts the hole. Um, so uh, other ideas about how you could make a hole, this is pretty thick. Um, another thing you could do actually, if you wanted to keep this end on, Make the holes in the other side. That's something you could probably puncture with a knife a little bit easier. Um, and Lillian also had a shovel that was made out of one of these, the way it's it's uh, cut out. And actually, so, some of the idea for this workshop too. I've been watching some videos online and some kind of garden hack videos or growing plants from uh, kitchen scraps. So. Um, I'm waiting for my seed order, so I'm doing any growing that I can inside. Thank you. I'm just checking back through the chat box. We've had a lot of really good questions, so thanks everyone for um, paying close attention and all your really good questions. Um, let's see. And just to wanted to double check, it's what would be the issue with using uh, soil from your garden or like in your backyard? to try to do seed starting? Mm -hmm. So th the the biggest issue with that, with, well, there's, there's two issues. One would be um, if there's any possibility of lead contamination, uh, then that would be a reason to definitely not um, use uh, soil that hasn't been tested uh, because you, know, you wouldn't want uh, contaminated soil to get on things that you're eating. Um, the other reason is because of that bacteria and the damp the damping off um, things. So I would say it's recommended. I mean, have I ever done that with garden soil? Yes, I have. <laughs> I, ha I have certain things inside with garden soil if there was no. Uh, and if I didn't have any tea leaves and I didn't have any potting soil or cocoa coir, I would probably try that rather than not gardening. Um, I know that you can also do, if you're doing the microgreens or the sprouting, it is possible to just even put a, a piece of paper toweling on the bottom of a container and then just have the sprouts up for there. But you wouldn't be able to grow like a box of herbs like this on a paper towel. You need, you need a little bit more. But you know, there is like the hydroponics that have those little terracotta things. Um, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's possible to put like styrofoam peanuts in one of these. And as long as they're kind of in sand, but then as long as they're um, really nourished with compost tea, I mean, I don't think that they would make hardy plants. Totally. That's a question. Yeah, that's a good question. That actually leads into another question that someone um, had was, do you know how um, herbs can grow in a hydroponic system setting um, in water without rotting versus being planted? I think there were just some questions on like how that works. Yeah. I mean, I think that actually a lot of, like, um, trying to think, I don't really have very much experience with hydroponics, except for a little bit of experience with roof gardening. And the uh, roof gardening that I did a long time ago, basically it's growing in expanded slate, very light materials, and there's no nutrition from those materials themselves. It's just everything is coming from the compost tea. So it's it's a it's a it's a good it's a good idea. It's, I imagine like if you have gravel, 
you know, if you have gravel, if you have sand, as long as the plants are um, getting some nutrition from a seaweed uh, emulsion, fish emulsion, or compost tea, that they could um, that they could uh, do well. Because I mean, we want to have plants that are going to like not just survive, but things that are going to thrive, and you're going to be able to harvest from, and they're going to be you know good good healthy plants. For sure. Um, we had a question on, do leaves turn yellow when you overwater? Uh, I don't know, maybe. Maybe they could. I think when they're, they probably can, I, I actually don't know that. I know they can turn yellow and brown when you underwater them. And sometimes when leaves turn yellow, it means, um, yeah, I think it. you can, because if they're overwatered, then they can have damage for the roots and then they just start getting getting yellow or, or brown or fall off. And sometimes that happens too if there's not enough uh, nutrition or sometimes it happens if there's too much nutrition or if there's too much fertilizer, like using the weak, weaker diluted fertilizer is important because if plants get too much fertilizer, then they'll have a lot of lush growth. And sometimes that's, they're really um, juicy and then pests are attracted to them more. So a nice slow release. Um, these are great ideas like seaweed. I'm like, I think I have some seaweed in my kitchen. Maybe I can mush it up and put it in some of my plants. Right. So definitely some opportunity for experimentation and learning and testing. Um, we also had a question about like putting different types of plants in one container or if you just should put one. Um, maybe that kind of goes into labeling as well. I, th definitely for labeling, I think that the most important um, uh, uh, thing in that question is matching up the plants in your container with the same conditions. So if you have a if you have a windowsill that's really sunny, um, and you put plants that like shade there, then or, or if you mixed it and had some that like sun and some that don't, then um, you know the ones that uh, uh, don't like sun could be weaker or maybe get dried out easier or something like that. And then if you have a location that's really shady and you put um, plants that need a lot of light, you know, they'll start that. Oh, and the other thing is too, on the windowsill, it's important to turn these, turn the container every day so that, because, you know, once you start, uh, you know, things will always grow towards the sun pretty much. Uh, and most plants like sun. For, sh for shade for shade things it's like these plants can tolerate some shade but you know six hours of sun a day would be ideal great um we also had a question on can you plant ginger from the grocery store thinking about like other things you can kind of yes. see around yes. so you can plant ginger from the grocery store oh the other thing i meant to say about the garlic which also garlic onions and ginger sometimes they're treated with um chemicals or something to kind of prevent them from sprouting because once they sprout, they're really not sellable. But actually I have, um, I have a pot of ginger on a windowsill and it's ginger that I bought at the food co-op. You know, I used some of it and I have a little bit there and I have grown that before. And you can also do that with lemongrass, uh, especially if it still has, a, if it has a little bit of um, root lid on the bottom. And same thing, potatoes, if you have some eyes of the potatoes, just cut them off, let them heal for maybe a day so that dries out and then they can be planted as well. Again, it's very recommended to buy disease-free certified seed potatoes, um, but if you can't get them and you can't go outside, then why not um, try something? I believe that there's a, a garden how-to at the BBG website uh that's it might be called kitchen botany um but there's 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 a, a part there with with growing plants from kitchen scrap mostly it's making ornamental plants it doesn't really produce um, more food um, but the garlic chives scallions that will eventually produce you know more things that you can eat and ginger awesome thank you um, we had another question on uh, what should you do for aphids? What should you do for aphids? 
Um, I guess you can you can spray them off just like in the garden. I think you can spray if it's off with um, you know a strong uh, thing of water. So if you take your container, if you have an aphid problem, and you take a container, and then you can spray them off or wipe them off. Um, I think also those little yellow sticky traps uh, can work. Or maybe I've tried because I don't like to spend money buying things. Um, uh, you know, getting a yellow post-it and covering it with Vaseline or something like that to trap aphids. Or I think sometimes some of the homemade sprays, um, like with garlic, are okay for aphids. I don't know. Maybe someone else could chime in about that. I haven't had that much aphid. Someone said you can take aphids off with tape or spray with diluted dish soap. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Similar uh, suggestions. Um, another question on how to make compost tea. If you have any particular tips for that. Mm -hmm. Well, there's there's a couple different kinds of compost tea. One that's really popular these days is the aerated compost tea, where you have a big bucket and you put like a, a fish tank bubbler in there and a little molasses and things like that, and that really makes the um, the good beneficial bacteria kind of like grow and expand. Um, you also can take a handful of compost, put it in a, a sock or old stocking or napkin or handkerchief or whatever, tie it up and just put it in a bucket of water and let it sit for a day or two. And you'll get some nutrition from that. And also um, vermicompost, the, the compost from worms, you know, once you harvest and the worms are out of there, a lot of times that the, the consistency of that compost is a little bit pasty or a little finer. And actually that's really easy to dilute in water. That actually ties into a good question. Um, someone said that they just attended the vermicomposting workshop we had before this. Is it safe to use worm castings on herbs and vegetable gardens? Yes. Yes, um, worm castings, which is, you know, the same thing as our compost are very, very uh, safe, wonderful things to use. And they actually have higher nutrition than a hot compost because since they're not heated up, they don't lose um, some of those nutrients, you know, to the heating pro heat process. Great. Um, someone asked, is it, is there any risk of like leaching of chemicals from plastic containers if you're using that as a material? Actually, there there is there is some uh, you know there is some evidence that plastic it's not totally impermeable, um, and I've seen things like if you basically had like chemicals or if this was filled with something that's you know like Easter egg dye or something that if it was sitting around for like a month when I poured it out there still might be some on there I don't know so I I try to avoid plastic. Um, if possible, and um, you know, I do try to upcycle and reuse things, but you could also use a container that could be wood, could be metal, it could be, you know, these are paper, um, but they're covered with something, some kind of plasticky, waxy thing. You could start these in a um, cardboard box, but the one thing is the sturdiness of the box is going to degrade as it gets watered. Um, so a terracotta container would be fine. Um, but again, if you don't, if you don't have it, then, you know, then uh, one of these alternates would be better. So I would say avoiding plastic. Oh, and that's something too that I wanted to say for the, um, for the lettuce and that for the two boxes that I showed in the beginning, those I started from transplants. Um, and I just wanted to show you I usually grow from transplants because seedlings just take so much work to water. And I have a soil blocker. So these are, this is a little parsley and a little cilantro from these tiny little soil blocks. And that way I'm, um, this is my first year using them. Uh, the blocker is kind of expensive, um, but you can, you can avoid plastic altogether because the soil gets kind of a compressed block and you can plant the seeds right in it and then you just lift them out with a knife and plant them and there's no transplant chalk. 
Great, thank you. So I know we are just about at 2.30 now, uh, but we've gotten through a ton of questions um, and really appreciate all of your insights and knowledge, Maureen. Um, I did link to the blog post that uh, Maureen mentioned that was on the Brooklyn Botanic Garden website. So we can also link that again. Um, that's just in the chat again now. Um, and Maureen's contact information um, was shared as well. So I'm sorry we won't be able to get to everyone's question, um, but thank you all so much for chiming in and tuning in today. Um, Maureen, is there anything else you wanted to add? Well, I'm hoping that you'll all have more questions and that you'll write to me at m-o-b-r-i-e-n at bbg.org. I'm very grateful that I'm working remotely and I look forward to your questions and also to revising this uh, lesson plan today with some of the information that you're going to share. So please share your other recipes, um, things that you think of tonight, that you think of tomorrow. Feel free to email me. And um, I'm just delighted to be able to be with you all today. And just please take care. <laughs> take care. Absolutely. Email. And we'll see each other on the other side. Definitely. Thank you so much, Maureen. We really appreciate it and for all of your work here. Um, and just wanted to mention again, today today we have a full day of workshops and keynotes um, through 7 p.m. Eastern uh, with Green Thumb for New York City Parks Green Thumb's Earth Day celebration. So the link is in the chat. Um, it's also on our website for the remaining workshops uh, the rest of the afternoon. Um, thank you all so much. If you just want to hop off uh, or uh, show your screen for a second and hop off mute and say thank you. Um, and yeah, stay safe, everyone, and thank happy you. gardening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was really helpful. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Yay, Maureen. Thank you, Maureen. Hey. Thank you so much, Maureen. We really appreciate it. Good to virtually see you. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. I think we're uh, all set and we'll uh, see you next time. Bye. See you at, see you at the next. See you at the. Uh, this is at Grand Fisher. Sounds good. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Mara. It's Andrea. Bye. Thank you. Andrea. <laughs>